पृथिवी शांतिरंतरिक्ष गांतिशातिरवांतर दिशा शातिरग्निशातिर्वायुशातिरादिशातिश्चंद्रमा शातिर्नक्षत्राणि शातिराप शातिरोषदय शातिर्वनस्पत शातिरशातिरश्वशातिपुरशातिर्ब्रह्मशातिर्ब्राह्मणशातिशातिरशातिर्मे अस्तु शांति May there be peace on earth and in the sky. May there be peace in the water and in all directions. May there be peace in the plants, in the trees and in animals. May there be peace in the hearts of all beings. May there be peace in everyone and in everything. Sarvetra sukhina santo sarve santo niramaya ha सर्वे भद्राणि पश्यन्तु मा कश्चित् दुःख भाग भवेत् सर्वस्तरतु दुर्गाणि सर्वो भद्राणि पश्यतु सर्वसद्बुद्धिमाप्नोतु सर्वसर्वत्र नन्दतु मे ऑल बी हैप्पी एंड हेल्दी मे ऑल सी व्हाट इज गुड and may no one experience misery may all overcome their obstacles and acquire good tendencies may people everywhere find joy and fulfillment let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts a good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point that point can be our own breathing let us therefore practice breathing with awareness as we breathe in let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love strength and compassion and as we breathe out let us release all the stress anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind let us practice this way for a while let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart although god is present everywhere and in everyone the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts we can meditate in any way we have been taught to remain focused we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of god in our hearts
असतो मा सत्कमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय आविरावीर्मे रुद्रय ते दक्षिण मुखम तेन मां पाहि नित्यम मे द डिवाइन लीडर्स फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोर्टैलिटी मे द डिवाइन कॉन्शियसनेस फिल अवर हार्ट्स एंड प्रोटेक्ट अस we'll continue the discussion on image worship that uh we were studying last week we saw how swami ji shows the significance of images in the hindu tradition how he shows its distinction how it's different from what is seen as idolatry so although he'll continue to use the word idol here what he is really saying is what others see as idols and what hindus call murti puja murti is an image and sometimes the word gets translated into english as idol um often without taking into consideration that the word idol has a specific theological meaning so let's continue the study that's on page 28 <coughs> the last sentence of the earlier para was man is to become divine in realizing the divine idols or temples or churches or books are only the supports the helps of his spiritual childhood but on and on he must progress so now what swami is doing here is trying to situate image worship where does image worship fit in a larger spiritual life so he is trying to see that among the different things we do as a part of our spiritual practice where does image worship find a place he must not stop anywhere external worship material worship say the scriptures is the lowest stage struggling to rise high mental prayer is the next stage but the highest stage is when the lord has been realized mark the same earnest man who is kneeling before the idol tells you him the sun cannot express nor the moon nor the stars the lightning cannot express him nor what we speak of as fire through him they shine but he does not abuse any one's idol or call its worship sin he recognizes in it a necessary stage of life the child is the father of the man would it be right for any old man to say that childhood is a sin or youth a sin so among the different ways image worship is seen in the tradition one is that we always travel from that which is more tangible more visible to the invisible the spiritual journey is from the sthula to the sukshma that which is gross to that which is subtle and the divine is the subtlest of all but right now what our senses can grasp what our mind can understand is 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 uh, visible tangible objects so we begin with that and if we remain stuck there then there is a problem it's a little bit like when we as babies first of course the baby is pretty helpless it's always mother is carrying the baby but then slowly after a few weeks and months the baby is able to make some movements and then is able to crawl on all fours and then gradually with taking support of this and that the baby is now able to stand and in the beginning um we know we just can't walk effortlessly right from the baby's stage uh and so there will be help of some external help needed and that help is necessary that help is good 
But if now I need that help all through life, I'm never able to walk on my own, then there is a problem. So that is what image worship is, that worshiping images using concrete, visible helps in our spiritual life is good. But if I remain stuck on that, if I'm not able to go beyond that, then there is a problem. We see that in, for instance, in a often quoted words of Ramakrishna, it comes very often in his conversations. Uh, those of you who have read the Gospel of Ramakrishna would have come across this passage where Sri Ramakrishna says, Sandhya merges in the Gayatri, the Gayatri merges in the Om. So what he's really saying is, so there is this a form of worship, a form of ritual called Sandhya, during, done during the twilight hours. Sandhya, Sandhi means joining, and it's the joining of the day and night. So in the tradition, therefore, there is this ritual that one is expected to perform early in the morning, just around sunrise, and in the evening, around sunset. That's where the day and night meet. And that, that is a ritual. You need to take water, there is a spoon, just like kind of a small puja. And then there are mantras to be chanted. And that's a very helpful practice. And people have done it. Now what Sandhya merges in the Gayatri means, that as a part of that ritual, there is this repetition of the Gayatri mantra is involved. So the ritual that is done, the puja that is done, is a help towards the repetition of that mantra, repetition of the Gayatri Japa. <clears throat> a stage will come in our life that if we do that twilight worship in the way it ought to be done, <clears throat> then a time will come when we will no longer need to do that external worship the purpose of that worship will be fulfilled when my mind merges, my mind is so absorbed while repeating the Gayatri Mantra that I may not need that preliminary puja to begin with. Then one only repeats the Gayatri Mantra. Now, the purpose of the Gayatri Mantra will be fulfilled when it's no longer necessary to repeat that entire prayer. It's a fairly not a very small mantra. It's, 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 it's bigger, bigger than many of the, the, the mantras that we are familiar with. And so a stage is reached when that inner purity of the heart is reached, then one is no longer needed, one no longer needs to repeat the entire Gayatri. That time it's enough to repeat simply Om, which is the very first word of the Gayatri prayer. Again, the idea is the same. You start from the gross, and as you advance, every practice has a certain purpose. When that purpose is fulfilled, you no longer need to do it. That is what is meant by saying Gayatri merges into, Sandhya merges into Gayatri, Gayatri merges into Om. And a repetition of Om then gives enlightenment. So that's, that's the process. And that's what Swamiji is describing here. So because of that, whatever supports we have in the early stages of our life, we may no longer need them, but we no, no longer need to look down upon them either. And therefore, it's, think about it this way. The, the books that we read when we were little children or the toys that we played with. Of course, when we grow up, we no longer need those books or those toys. But then to say, oh, that's just nonsense, that's just childish, that's, that's ridiculous, that, that doesn't make sense. Because at that stage of my life, those toys, those books uh, were very meaningful to me then. I may no longer need them, but they have played a role in my development. And that is why Swamiji is quoting here this, the child is the father of the man. It's from William Wordsworth's poem. Um, my heart leaps up. It's also known as the rainbow. 
So the child is the father of the man essentially means that a lot of our adult life is shaped by our childhood. And so therefore everything that we experienced, everything that we did in our childhood may no longer be needed. We might have outgrown that need, but we need not or cannot simply say that that was just useless or that was just a waste. Everything has a... And this is, the, I think, in general, a good perspective to have in life. That one, one, one thing I like to look at it this way, that nothing and no one in life is totally useless. Everything, every person, every idea, every little thing has some role to play in the larger picture. That doesn't mean I need everything. That doesn't mean everything needs to play a role in my life. But every being, living or non-living, every object is playing some role. And it's based on the assumption that if something or someone is totally useless, it has nothing at all to contribute to the world, then such is the law of life, it won't exist. It'll just disappear. Think about it this way. The great Roman Empire, or the, the, the Roman civilization, the, the Egyptian civilization, they are no longer there. Now, should we say, oh, they, are, they were just worthless to begin with? No. At one time, they ruled the world. Now, they had something to contribute to hist in history. They had something to contribute for the growth and evolution of the world. As long as that their existence, their existence was assured, as long as that purpose was not fulfilled. But when the time came, that, well, they have nothing more to add to this world, then the whole thing crumbled. So this is one good thing to, to keep in mind, that every religion that survives, every ideology that survives, no matter how worthless it might appear, some of that to us, um, it is still playing some role in life. Again, I'm not suggesting that Everything needs to play a role in my own life. Maybe most of the things I may have nothing to do with, but they are playing a role in somebody's life, contributing to the world in some way, which is why they exist. And therefore, image worship is playing an important role, but that role is to guide us towards a higher ideal, to take us from that which is visible to that which is invisible. That is what Swamiji is pointing out here. If a man can realize his divine nature with the help of an image, would it be right to call that a sin? Nor even when he has passed that stage, should he call it an error? To the Hindu, man is not traveling from error to truth, but from truth to truth, from lower to higher truth. To him, all the religions from the lowest fetishism in the, to the highest absolutism mean so many attempts of the human soul to grasp and realize the infinite, each determined by the conditions of its birth and association, and each of these marks a stage of progress. And every soul is a young eagle soaring higher and higher, gathering more and more strength till it reaches the glorious sun. <clears throat> so this is what Swamiji is saying. So instead of looking upon everything in our life as a journey from error to truth, it's so much more positive and constructive to look that in our life we are passing from truth to truth, a truth that is lower to truth that is higher. And that's what I mentioned about how Santa Claus may be very real to us at some stage of our life. And then when we grow up, we can laugh at it and say, oh, that was a, what a thing I was believing in. But no, at that stage of my life, 
the faith in Santa Claus or, or angels uh, did contribute to me in some way. That is why they say that the, the loss of a favorite toy to a little baby and the loss of a kingdom to a king, there is no difference. To a little baby, that toy is like, it, that baby is all in all. And if that toy is lost, the pain that the baby feels and that the pain that a king may feel when a kingdom is lost, there is no difference. Although, objectively it looks like, oh, that's just a toy, you can get another one. No, but to the baby, that's not re replaceable. And so that is what is meant here by saying that um, every little thing has a role to play. And at different stages in life, they will have different um, value to us in our own lives. Page 30. <clears throat> Unity in variety is the plan of nature, and the Hindu has recognized it. Every other religion lays down certain fixed dogmas and tries to force society to adopt them. It places before society only one coat, which must fit Jack and John and Henry all alike. If it does not fit John or Henry, he must go without a coat to cover his body. The Hindus have discovered that the absolute can only be realized or thought of or stated through the relative. And the images, crosses, and crescents are simply so many symbols, so many pegs to hang spiritual ideas on. It is not that this help is necessary for everyone, but those that do not need it have no right to say that it is wrong, nor is it compulsory in Hinduism. <clears throat> So Swamiji is pointing out some of the <clears throat> special characteristics in the tradition. Because historically Hinduism is one of the oldest of surviving traditions, we see within the tradition <clears throat> a range of practices. And he mentioned it earlier, fetishism to absolutism. Fetishism would mean uh, looking upon an, any objects with some supernatural powers. You know about <clears throat> people sometimes wear amulets or think about <clears throat> certain precious stones and feel that this is my lucky charm or have things. And so that is sometimes called a, a fetish or a fetishism, a belief in that. And on the other end of the spectrum is absolutism, believing in the the absolutes, and these absolutes can exist in, in different fields. And people speak about moral absolutes. The people, people in studying politics think about absolutes in politics. But what Swamiji is primarily referring here to is the absolute truth. For instance, in Vedanta, they'll say chit or chaitanya, consciousness itself, that's absolute. Absolute in the sense it is not affected by time, space, and causality. None of the external factors can affect this. So it is immutable, un unchangeable. So on one hand, on one side you have these absolutes, on the other side you have the fet fetish fetishes. And then there are these range of different beliefs, practices, and so on. Not all of these practices may be for us, some of these practices may be meaningful to us, some of them may not be. But what Swamiji is saying is that just because something is not meaningful to me, just because it doesn't make sense to me, then for me to condemn it wouldn't make sense. Because it may not make sense to me, but it makes sense to somebody else. It may have no use for me, but it has use for someone else. So that is what has given the Hindu tradition its universality. It's spirit of not just tolerating others, but accepting everything. Accepting that <clears throat> these are the things I find meaningful, but it's quite possible that there are other things which other people find, may find meaningful. And so that mutual respect that comes through acceptance, this is at the basis of it. And that's what Swamiji says is unity 
in variety is the plan of nature. That we don't condemn or deny the diversity that exists, but all that the tradition says that if we look more carefully at that diversity, underlying that diversity, we will find a great unity. So we can celebrate the diversity while remaining firmly um, immersed in that unity. So we can have the best of both the worlds, although they are not really two worlds in some sense. <laughs> <clears throat> One thing I must tell you, idolatry in India does not mean anything horrible. It is not the mother of harlots. On the other hand, it is the attempt of undeveloped minds to grasp high spiritual truths. The Hindus have their faults. They sometimes have their exceptions. But mark this, they are always for punishing their own bodies and never for cutting the throats of their neighbors. If the Hindu fanatic burns himself on the pyre, he never lights the fire of inquisition. And even this cannot be laid at the door of his religion any more than the burning of witches can be laid at the door of Christianity. <clears throat> so what Swamiji is really pointing out is a kind of a common weakness that people have. And that weakness is that <clears throat> sometimes it is described this way. My doxy is orthodoxy. Your doxy is heterodoxy. In other words, we might have our own special beliefs. And we look at our own beliefs or our own uh, beliefs in a very different light. So my belief is, oh, this is something very sacred to me. And someone else's belief is, oh, that's just superstition. Essentially, there are just two sets of beliefs. But I treat my beliefs in a different way than someone else's beliefs. It's a little bit like someone can say, oh, I love children. But to parents, oftentimes, uh, their own children are still a little bit different from others. The, you, the way we look at our own children and the way we look at other children, there is going to be some difference. And so that is, that is what Swamiji is pointing out here. The, the, it's not that easy to be, I mean, people speak about being non-judgmental. People speak about looking upon everyone with an equal eye. Now, to be truly non-judgmental, to look at everyone with the same, in the same way, that's possible only when one is completely enlightened. We can strive to be non-judgmental. We can strive to look upon everyone with an, um, <clears throat> equally. And when we succeed in doing that, we would have become enlightened. But unless and until we have become enlightened, <clears throat> uh, that kind of a perfection can't come. And that's what Swamiji is pointing out here. <clears throat> To the Hindu then, the whole world of religions is only a traveling, a coming up of different men and women through various conditions and circumstances to the same goal. Every religion is only evolving a God out of the material man, and the same God is the inspirer of all of them. Why then are there so many contradictions? They are only apparent, says the Hindu. The contradictions come from the same truth adapting itself to the varying circumstances of different natures. <clears throat> One way of understanding the presence of different religions is to think about it this way that questions about life, questions about the world, questions about ourselves, question about purpose of all this, these questions have come into the human heart throughout history. And 
people have asked those questions to themselves, and they have struggled to find answers to those questions. Now, as a result of the different struggles they had, eventually, they started thinking about what could be the answers to this question. Now, thinking, any kind of a thinking activity really requires the use of ideas and concepts. Without ideas and concepts, you cannot think. I mean, that, that's the, the raw material for thinking. And so when people were grappling with these different questions, they had to use ideas, they had to use concepts. And the concepts and ideas that we use are heavily influenced by the, first of all, the ability of the mind itself, but also the images, the, the similes, the metaphors, the language, the cultural symbols, all of these things, the environment where we grow, they do shape the way we think and how we think. And so while the questions that human beings asked were not different, the answers they got were clothed in different languages, were using different conceptual frameworks with different examples, different symbols. And so the answers look really very different. <clears throat> One contemporary example might be whenever there is a, the General Assembly of the United Nations meets, do they meet once a year annually? Any UN specialists here? Well, they do meet occasionally. And so, and that's really, it's a big thing. Of course, it's in New York, and then you find um, heads of states from many, many different countries descend there. And some of them you'll have find they, have, they wear their national attire. Uh, they clearly, many of them come from, speak languages which are native to those places. And all of them are attending <clears throat> the same event. Now afterwards, if you ask them to describe what they saw, or write it, write it, or even speak about it, what they say is not going to sound the same at all, because they're going to speak in different languages. And their, what they say and how they say it will depend upon their power of expression and the images and the words and et cetera that they use. But they were all describing the same thing. So that's how I see different religions of the world. They are all trying to describe the same thing, but using different languages and different stuff. And by language, I just don't mean words. Uh, a ritual is a language. How we do a worship, that's a language. Um, prayer, of course. How we pray, not just the words that are used in prayer, but do I kneel down, do I stand, do I bow, how do I bow down? All of these things, these are different languages through which one is trying to communicate with a higher ideal. And that is what Swamiji is pointing out here. Why are then there are so many contradictions? They are only apparent, says the Hindu. The contradictions come from the same truth adapting itself to the varying circumstances of different natures. It is the same light coming through glasses of different colors. And these little variations are necessary for purposes of adaptation. But in the heart of everything, the same truth reigns. The Lord has declared to the Hindu in his incarnation as Krishna, I am in every religion in the thread as, as the thread through a string of pearls. This is from the Gita. Wherever thou seest extraordinary holiness and extraordinary power raising and purifying humanity, know thou that I am there. And what has been the result? I challenge the world to find throughout the whole system of Sanskrit philosophy any such expression as that the Hindu alone will be saved and not others. Says Vyasa, we find perfect men even beyond the pale of our caste and creed. <clears throat> One thing more, how then can the Hindu whose whole fabric of thought centers in God 
believe in Buddhism, which is agnostic, or in Jainism, which is atheistic. <clears throat> the Buddhists or the Jains do not depend upon God, but the whole force of their religion is directed to the great central truth in every religion, to evolve a God out of man. They have not seen the Father, but they have seen the Son, and he that had seen the Son had seen the Father also. And the next section then, Swamiji will go to describe what he sees as the ideal of a universal religion. How these apparently different religions, how is it possible to discover the unity that underlies these different religions? But before I go to that next section, uh, uh, if you have any thoughts or ideas or comments about this whole discussion about image worship, where it fits in, and, and the different ideas that came up up to this point today. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Mm -hmm. Anish. <coughs> so Swamiji, it seems to me that, that, you know, maybe I'm biased, but with Vedanta, you know, this is the truth seems the, the, the religious spiritual truth seemed to be more evident perhaps. And it seems that's the core of all religions, if I understand what Swami Vivekananda is saying. But then the way that we clothe it in terms of rituals and so forth is different. So it makes me wonder whether you know these these core ideas would somehow find their way into other religions as well. You know, in a more explicit way. Mm -hmm. You know, could they find their way into Christianity in a more explicit way, or you know, whatever any 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 other religion? Because it seems like the core concepts of spirituality seem to be more evident. You know, maybe I'm biased, you know, in Vedanta. Sure, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, but then maybe they would be, you know, maybe over time yeah. they'll become more evident in these other religions as well. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing we might ask is, what is religion or spirituality What does it do? Or what should it do? Or what can it do? And broadly what we might say, and again, this is not necessarily the way it gets described in every tradition, but I'm just kind of presenting a very neutral, what I think, I, I'm biased too. <laughs> um, what it seems to me is a kind of a more neutral way of putting it, and it is this. It's not too difficult to recognize that we work and live under limitations. Clearly, as a human being, <clears throat> there are limitations involved. Um, we are subject to the laws of physics, for instance. I, whether I like it or not, I have to obey the law of gravity. There's nothing I can do about it. So th those are the limitations. The body is a part of this material world, and there are these material laws. So the body cannot transcend those laws. The mind, again, mind also is <coughs> wonderful as the, and powerful as this instrument is. It's also very limited. There is, after some time, the mind can get exhausted. There is a, there is a limit is reached. We also know that while the desire, there is a great desire to do or, or achieve or attain a lot of things, the body and the mind, mm. they hold us down. They will not let us do everything that we want, just the body and mind are limited. And so, one way of understanding spirituality is as something that can help me overcome these limitations of my human existence. And whatever would help me transcend those human limitations, I would say, that is the truth. That is my religion. Now, in, in different ways, 
that is what different traditions are doing, although they are not stating it in, in a kind of a, a completely neut <laughs> neutral way as I have done. I mean, think about it this way. To think that after I die, I'm going to heaven and live eternally with the Lord. I think what it's saying that there is this mystery. I don't know what's going to happen to me after death. But this way of life guarantees that after death, which is a limitation upon me, that limitation of death is transcended. I know exactly where I'm going, and I'm going to be there in complete bliss, which I don't have right now. So I'm going to attain something which I badly want, but which I don't have now. And this is the way of life that can give me. So even when I, if I think about the goal of life as going to heaven and living there eternally, essentially what I'm seeing is transcending my human limitations. If I think about the goal as nirvana, everything just goes. Again, what does it do? It removes all my suffering. Dukkha, dukkha, that's what the Buddha said. So suffering seems inseparable from my human existence. Now, if I think about the goal at nirvana as something that will completely free me from suffering, again, I'm transcending the limitations of mine. So whichever way that goal is conceived, I'm really thinking about it as transcending or, or going beyond the limitations of my existence. And therefore, Vedanta says, what everyone wants is the same thing, although we might phrase it differently. We might visualize it differently, but essentially that's the same thing. That's the idea. Yeah. Any other thought, idea? Srikant, yeah. <coughs> um, Swamiji, uh, as, uh, Swamiji explains that uh, doing image worship or idolatry is considered as a lower stage or first stage or something like that. But uh, we have seen, uh, like in Bhakti Yoga, Swamiji says that that can even lead to your realization. So, how the, how do we see it as lower stage? It is equal no, it to the, <coughs> all the same stages. <coughs> no, I mean, it can lead to realization. What it means is that that can take you to higher and higher stages and lead you to realization. Mm, but. But can it not be a higher stage itself? But uh, there are saints who are just uh, like even Ramakrishna, who who no, he went to a higher worship. stage. He uh, when he when he started worshiping the the divine mother Kali, he when he started he saw there a granite stone image, and then later on <coughs> that worship took him to a higher stage by which he no longer saw the image. He saw a living, breathing Divine Mother. So that is a higher stage. Hmm. But he was still uh, praying to the image. No, no. He's no longer seeing the image. How can he be praying to the image when he's not even seeing the image? He's just seeing a living mother there. So that is a higher stage. And so therefore, <coughs> But therefore, he didn't say, oh, unless if you don't see the mother, then this puja is worthless. He didn't say that because he knew that that's how even he started. That's how everyone starts. But if all through my life, if I'm just seeing that just that image and seeing nothing beyond it, that means my growth is stunted. I haven't, I haven't grown. Mm -hmm. Just like I might need help to walk. But if I all along, all through my life, I need a support, I cannot walk without that support. That means my growth is stunted. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, uh, there are higher stages. Yeah. yeah, but it might be appearing for others is the same stage because he would be praying to the same image. But the transformation has happened in him where he is seeing the image as a God. Okay, but... But whether the others, people, but, but uh, doesn't yeah. matter what, whether others see or not. We are not talking about what others see. We are just saying about. When Swamiji explains here what Hindu does, it is for others. It is not for the person who is transformed, isn't it? 
No, so no, what, when, I didn't get your point. Uh, so, when Swamiji explains that doing puja or worship is a lower stage. Yes. So, but people who realized God, they mm. are still doing the puja uh, even after realization. So what? Uh, that, but that, that appears <coughs> to be lower stage for people who are looking at it. No. After they have attained God, they really don't have to be doing anything. So, if they are doing that, they are continuing to do that worship, it's not then to get anything. They have already gotten what that worship is going to give. Yeah, but people who look at that, they think that they are still at the lower stage. That's why he's saying that, mm. that don't think this way. He's telling us. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So, Swamiji, I feel sometimes it's not obvious when to move from Sandhya to Gayatri to Om. No, no, you, 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 you don't have to decide it. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, it'll, it'll automatically happen. I won't ask you where we are. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like <coughs> uh, uh, there is a <coughs> one of the things that uh, examples that Ramakrishna gives is that when there is a big feast, um, and so before the food is served, there's a lot of talk going on, people are talking. And once the food is served, then they eat, and then <clears throat> now and then they may talk something. But after the delicious meal is taken, then there is no more talk. Then people say, okay, I just want to go and lie down and take some rest. So <clears throat> what was the point? <laughs> I can really... I, I, Sandhya and Gayatri, yes. So, in the same way, as we advance in certain thing, then we automatically know that the next stage has come. We don't have to, we don't have to decide. Um, and and so, uh, Sri Ramakrishna also gives the example about uh, some songs that there's, there is a Bengali song, Nitayamar Mata Hati. Well, I don't know, I won't translate it, but essentially, there are certain uh, in in India, they say dhun. Uh, you kind of uh, keep on repeating some line in ecstatic singing, and so there are times when people will be in kirtan when they'll be singing something, and they are repeating, and the mind gets so absorbed into that. After that, they don't repeat that whole line at all. Maybe they just take one word and keep on repeating. So this is a little bit like that. So that when Ramakrishna, when Ramakrishna when he was doing puja. He didn't worry about when my puja is going to come to an end or when will the next stage come. When he, he himself became incapable of doing puja, when the next stage was reached, uh, he could not do puja. In fact, he could not just follow the rules at that point. And so, we, yeah, we don't have to worry about it. It will take care of itself. Sometimes, sometimes uh, in spiritual life, we have this thing about work, the work that we all have to do, the part of our duties and responsibilities in life. And then, of course, there is our spiritual practice. And sometimes we, we, we might wonder, like, how much time shall I spend in work? How much time shall I give in spiritual practice? And one of the things that karma yoga is meant for is to remove this division between work and worship. That if whatever work I have to do in life, can I try to look upon that as well as a part of my spiritual life? And then I don't have to decide when I have to stop it or give it up. When my love for God increases to such an extent that I become incapable of doing the work that I'm supposed to do, the work itself will leave me rather than me leaving the work. And that's what, when Ramakrishna was, a, was an employee, he was, a, he was a pujari, he used to do worship in the temple. He used to get his monthly salary. So he didn't worry about, oh, when I should, when I'm so thinking about the mother, I need early retirement. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't talk about that at all. He was, whether, when he's doing, of, I mean, I think, I think, he, I think just to kind of balance it out in this way. In some sense, you could say he was lucky because his work 
was a part of, it was easy for him to look upon his work as his part of a spiritual practice because he was really doing worship. And sometimes it may not be as easy if you're involved in some, what we might today call a very secular activity and to say, well, this is same as worship. But, but that's, that's essentially the principle behind karma yoga. So a time was reached in Ramakrishna's life when not that he wanted to give up worship, the worship gave him up. He, was, he became incapable of doing it. And that's when, actually, there is this beautiful verse in the Gita uh, when Krishna speaks about yoga kshema. Um, and what that verse says is, when a person learns or begins to see the presence of God everywhere and thinks of nothing but God or the spiritual ideal, at that stage, clearly, if that's all the time, if I'm thinking about that, it's going to be impossible to do any other thing. But when that happens, Krishna says, I do yoga kshema for that person. And yoga kshema means I carry to that person whatever that person needs and I preserve whatever that person has. So yoga means whatever this person wants, I, the Lord himself will bring it. Kshema means I'll protect and preserve whatever needs to be preserved. Now, you say, well, how is the Lord going to come and give it? And there are many stories uh, to describe. Uh, it's not necessarily that some kind of a divine angel will come and do it, although that's also possible. But in mysterious ways, we will find in most unexpected ways, in unexpected manner, things will happen and smoothen our, our path in life. And so all that we need to do as spiritual seekers is to keep our mind focused on God. And even if the environment or the situation or the circumstances may not be completely favorable to us in the way we want it, if we have that kind of a prayerful attitude, we will see. And we need patience also that the circumstances have a way of rearranging themselves in, and then smoothen or facilitate my way in spiritual life. It, there is a way to do it, but we need faith, we need patience, and it happens. Um, but for that, we'll have to have that simplicity and, and faith and a, of, of, <coughs> of a little child. What prevents us from right now of attaining that simplicity is the presence of the ego. As long as the ego is there, that's the main hurdle in life. There is a Bengali song um, it says, uh, uh, goes like this. Dak de kimon, dakar moton, kamon shama thakte pare. And simply means, shama means the divine mother. That, <laughs> oh my mind, you call out to the divine, pray to the divine in such a way that the divine mother just will not be able to stop from coming. It's like a, a little baby. If Ramakrishna gives the example of, of a baby, as long as the baby is playing with the toys, and then the mom is busy in the kitchen cooking, and now and then the child will call and say, Mom, please come here. And mom says, no, no, I'm busy doing, and there is lots of toys that ch the child is busy playing with. But after a time will come, the little baby will just get tired, won't, won't want any of those toys, and will just kind of be crying, just crying, nonstop crying. And then the mother says, well, I have to go and pick up my baby now because those toys are no longer working. It doesn't, not distracting the baby anymore. So similarly, as long as the toys of this material world have some meaning for us, the Divine Mother says, okay, I'm, I don't know what kind of cooking the Divine Mother is doing, <laughs> but there's, the Divine Mother says, okay, these babies are busy with all these toys. Let them be busy. But when slowly and slowly all of these toys around us start losing their relevance and value, and then we're like a little baby, you're going to say, no, I want the Lord. I want 
the spiritual ideal. Not, I know that nothing around me is going to satisfy me. When that, that's what I mean by that simplicity and earnestness and faith of a child. Then, that's what the song says. Then the Divine Mother sees the baby is crying and the mother will, cannot stop. The mother will come and pick us up. Now, to reach that stage, we simply, we just cannot pretend, oh, I don't have an ego. And people say like that. Everyone has an ego. As long as the eye sense is there, as long as the feeling of responsibility is there, as long as the sense of this is my duty, I must do it is there. And so ego doesn't necessarily mean something bad or negative. But even as long as I feel, oh, this is my duty, I need to do it. This is my responsibility. Now, that's a good ego, but an ego nonetheless. So as long as this sense of I is strong, um, that's, that's, that's going to be a hurdle. And so what Ramakrishna said was, if the I is going to be there, then let me make this I connected with God in some way. If there's going to be an ego, let me be egoistic about my connection with God. I could say, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of Holy Mother. Now that's an ego, but that ego will not hurt me. That ego, in fact, will take me closer and closer. And even that ego will slip away, and then the Divine Mother will come. So that's the idea. What? Swamiji, uh, would you mind to just explain the last two lines of today's discussion in a little bit more detail? Uh, they have not seen the Father, but... Which one? The very last two lines, uh, page 32. Uh, they have not seen the father, but they have seen the son. And... Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. They have not seen the father, but they have seen the son. And he that had seen the son had seen the father also. The Buddhists and the Jains are not... Yeah, so what's, what's the difficult? I didn't, I didn't really understand like, what the true meaning of those two lines. So what Swamiji is saying is, even though the Buddhists and the Jains, they don't speak about God the way some of the other religions do, and yet we consider them as a religion, because they have seen the truth, although they do not call the truth or see it in a way of God. So because they have seen the truth, that truth is really come from the source or is identified with God itself. So the fact that they have seen the truth is that they have seen the child and the father and the child are not two different things. So, so just because they don't use the word God doesn't mean that there is no God in it. And, 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 and we have seen this before. Uh, one other point is that the religion of the books and the religion at is, at is, as it is practiced not necessarily always the same. By that I mean, uh, thinking about Buddhism and Jainism in a, in a philosophical way, we can say oh, they are agnostics and they are and atheists and so on. But if you see a common Buddhist or a Jain, when they, because there, are, there are Jain temples, there are Buddhist temples. So when a common person goes to a temple where there is this beautiful image of the Buddha, or a beautiful image of the Tirthankar Mahavir, that time they are not, in their mind, they are not thinking, oh, there is no God. There is, they are not. A common person prays to Buddha or prays to Tirthankar Mahavir exactly in the same way a person might pray to Krishna or to Jesus. So the, the, the mental processes are exactly the same. But again, we try to discuss it and think about it philosophically, say, no, 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 that's not God. But everything else is exactly the same. So it's more a kind of a semantics in the words that are used, but the actual uh, practice, there isn't really too much difference. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in Southeast Asia, when I was there a few years ago, 
um, and some of some of us may have seen that in in uh, we don't have to go to Southeast Asia to see this, but in many Buddhist temples, so they have there's incense and there's the worship, not different at all from the way it's worshipped in other temples as well, and that's why I said the the religion of a theologian and the religion of a common person. Um, uh, that you'll find sometimes it almost feels like there are two different religions. For that matter, how many Hindus who read the Upanishads or the Gita? Again, I think it's think for a very small number. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not religious. They could be very religious. I mean, they lot of lot of Hindus their their knowledge about their religion comes from Ramayana or the Mahabharata or many of the stories in the Puranas. And they are, and those, all of those things are based on the same principles of the Upanishads and the Gita. So they may not go to the original source, but they are still getting the same truths that are filtered through these different stories. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so speaking of egos, I had a small question. Um, when, when Krishna says to Arjun that you should go fight um, for the Dharma, he's calling out to Krishna. Um, um, Arjun's ego as a fighter to go do his job. Um, but, but I feel that um, in many instances, the same uh, ego of Arjuna being the best um, archer in the world has led to um, him being too egoistic. So I feel that there's a very small distinction between when it's a good thing to have the ego and when it's when it can lead to um, problems and how and as do you far as the ego is concerned it's not like we have a choice i mean ideally we say well ideally it'll be good to get rid of the ego but you know just that's just a hope so right now we don't have a choice about whether to have our ego or not right now our only choice is the ego which is there can i direct my ego in such a way that rather than being an obstacle in my path, it will be a help in my path. And that is what Ramakrishna meant by saying ripe ego and unripe ego. So in the beginning, we, it's not a choice between having an ego or not having an ego. That's not a choice right now. The choice is, let me make my ego healthy and positive. A healthy ego can transcend itself. An unhealthy, weak, negative, destructive ego uh, cannot transcend itself. So that's the, that's the choice. And what Krishna was doing to Arjuna was <clears throat> not trying to remove his ego at all. All that he was saying is, in fact, do your duty. And your duty is this. What Arjuna was saying first, that was not his duty. So it, Krishna was not telling Arjuna to go and fight per se, but was telling, do your duty. It so happened at that instance Arjuna's duty required of him to fight. That is the idea. So uh -huh. we, will, we will not always have a Krishna to tell us that that's, that's your duty at that point in time, hmm? right? We'll, always, we'll never have like a Krishna to tell us that that's your duty of at course, that point. Of course, Krishna is always telling us. We are not listening. <coughs> so uh, to his point, there is a story. I just wanted to like narrate that. So the story is that there is a person, he's with his friend, and he walks into a room, and he's facing uh, in a particular direction, and he sees three walls, and he's, like, yelling, like, you know, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, like, you know, I can't, there is no exit, what am I going to do? So his friend comes from behind, and he taps his shoulder and says, why don't you look the other way, and he sees the exit. So that's not where the story ends. The story ends where he's about to walk to the exit, and his friend says, what are you doing? So he's like, oh, the exit is right there. I, I found the exit, so I'm going to go to the other side. He says that, you know, you know the exit is over there, so why don't you just do your duty over here? You, you know that's where you have to go. So just, like, let the, let the movie play on the screen, essentially. So the way I see uh, what Krishna is trying to tell Arjun over there is that do your duty you know, there is no ego. What are you trying to do over here is you, you came here to do this, do it, and don't think 
about your ego or any of that because you know the exit is right there you just you just let the movie play on the screen and once the movie is played out you you just go through the exit so yeah so yeah correct yeah well, the only problem is <coughs> we don't know it's a movie <laughs> yeah, yeah. The- if you know it's a movie then there is no no playing there is no don't you don't need to let the movie run if you know it's a movie if it's interesting you can watch otherwise you can walk out anytime you can go straight to the exit <laughs> yeah. No, 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 not that they can't do their duty. If they do their duty in a proper way, that is what karma yoga means, it purifies their heart. Once the heart is purified, they know it's a movie. Exactly. Uh, unless the heart is purified, yeah. you will not know it's a movie that is running. So there you will not going to see any exit. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. So we will we'll stop here today. <coughs> जननी सारता देवी रामकृष्ण जगद्गु पादपद्मे तयोश्रिवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मु So next study group meeting will be after a while. So we will meet uh, in mid-February. I think it's probably February. Oh, let's see, imagine the problem. February 12th, I think. So the second Wednesday in February, we will resume this. Because next, next, uh, next Tuesday is Christmas, right? next Tuesday yeah so then now the Christmas holidays begin and then in on in January we are close for the winter yeah so in um, next month we'll be close for the winter recess so if you get a chance during this winter there is if a lot of snow there you don't have to go out anywhere there is and then if this book is lying nearby and give it a read and then and then if there are any questions or doubts you can just note it down and then when we meet in february we will take them up and then we will do the rest of the booklet as well this sunday we'll have a birthday we'll celebrate the birthday of uh, sharada devi that puja will begin at 10:30 as usual there'll be music um, worship flower offering and then prasad so all of you are welcome the puja begins at 10:30 on on sunday and should finish around or approximately around 1 o'clock so that's the sunday program uh, two days later that's next tuesday uh, we'll have our christmas eve celebration starting at 6:30 in the evening so no uh, meditation on saturday so the next program will be the puja on sunday at 10:30 So let's conclude with a prayer now. <clears throat> May the divine being who is the father in heaven of the Christians Holy One of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God. in our own hearts and in everyone around us may god bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude grace and love om shanti 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 hi
peace, peace, peace be unto all.